Well, let's... Here's the ten. Okay. Three caps. Good. You are looking at a traveler who just bought a ticket for a very special kind of a trip. The cost? A few dollars. And his mind, over which he will very shortly have little or no control. Now most of his preparations have been made, and he's just about ready to go. He won't have to leave this room if he doesn't want to, but he'll travel so far that he may get lost and never come back. Transportation to the fantastic and frightening territory of inner space, courtesy of the most powerful mind-altering drug ever discovered. Destination unknown, courtesy of LSD-25. chemical name is dextrolysergic acid diethylamide tartrate 25. But as everyone knows, I'm called LSD for short, though I'm also called acid, and by some highly unflattering names by those who wish I had never been discovered. Right now, some 200 micrograms of my substance have just entered his body, and already my potent molecules are on their way to his brain, where they will trigger some very special chemistry. And in just a few minutes now, I will show him glimpses of distorted beauty. Or throw him into a terror. But at just this moment, neither he nor I know the direction or destination of the trip we're about to take together. Round, round, out of your mind. You think you're seeing things, I know you're blind. A million bright colors explode in your head. Today you're just high, tomorrow you're dead. Round, round, out of your mind. That's right. And as you might imagine, not all of the people who know about me approve of what I am or what I do. These people, for example, have seen my effects and think I'm a total disaster. But they know, too, that I'm part of the scene and that I can be purchased much more easily than you might think. Well, I think it's pretty easy because, uh, well, like this one last night, this one dude walked up and he just handed me some, you know. So I just went ahead and took it. <laughs> you can you can be standing uh, on a street corner and and somebody will approach approach you. It's too easy to get acid. There's too many teeny boppers running around town. I can get acid by simply calling a friend, and I can get as much or as little as I want within a very short amount of time. The acid for me is. Very easy to get. I can get it from anywhere from four blocks to ten blocks from my house in about 20 minutes. See, what did I tell you? Kids know. Of course, I'm not exactly the exclusive property of young people, but kids know a lot about me. More than most older people, for example. They're damaged for life, their brains are wrecked, they go into institutions, they're, they're through for the rest of their life. I've read some silly things about kids falling out of trees and painting themselves green and yellow, and uh, it's rather stupid to me. It's no good. They're taking it in sugar cubes, it's being dropped into their punch. Well, truthfully, my friend, I know nothing about it. Only what I've read in the paper, what I see on television, and that's about all. We've got to do something about this, don't you think so? But I don't know. I don't know what these things are. I've become a favorite topic of conversation almost everywhere. And the mere mention of my three-letter name is enough to send certain writers running to turn out sure-selling articles on how horrible I am. As publishers know, I'm good copy. And since there's so much information and misinformation about me, it's easy to keep the LSD pot boiling.
well, that sort of thing is bad for my image, as the advertising people say. Sensational, sure fire in the paperbacks, but so much of it lacks the saving virtue of truth. There hasn't been a case reported yet where I poisoned anyone. But speaking frankly, a lot of my most ardent supporters are bad for my image, too. Like these three clowns from Southern California who are planning the beginning of something they call Acid City. So that's the scene. Folks like these who love me and think I belong in everyone's breakfast cereal. And way over in the other direction, the Fright Boys with their sure sell magazines and comic books. Things being what they are, you really can't blame me for wanting to put the record straight. It is, as they say, time for the facts. High time. It's hard really to put it in word, word form. Uh, you can't really tell a person what it's like unless you've had the experience for yourself. It just, um, well, it's different. Someone like uh, John Glenn trying to explain what he saw in outer space. I mean, it's a very personal thing. It's not easy to describe. No, I'm not easy to describe. I'm a complicated thing, and I'm here in complicated times and in complicated places. But now, let me tell you what I really am and what I really do. Chemically, I look like this. Atoms of oxygen linked with carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Much more complicated than some people seem to think. In fact, the slightest change in my chemical structure may result in profound changes in my potency, as certain black market amateur chemists have found out. Actually, I'm not very spectacular to look at. I'm colorless, odorless, and tasteless. In fact, I'm a kind of a nothing. But I'm one of the most powerful nothings that ever came down the chemical road. Just one of my drops can be enough for 500 average doses. I'm so powerful that I exert an effect in doses smaller than such potent drugs as strychnine or cyanide. My discoverer found that out back in 1943 when he accidentally inhaled a microscopic speck of me and then took to his bed with hallucinations. How can I tell you how really powerful I am? The head of a pin can hold enough of me to send a room full of people out of their minds. A dose for one? The point of a pin holds plenty for a solo trip. Twenty doses can be put under a stamp. An eyedropper can contain enough for 10,000 doses. I measured in millionths of a gram called micrograms or gammas, so tiny that even the precision laboratory scales like this can't begin to measure me accurately. I can be either liquid or solid, and the black market chemists who make me package me in capsules and tablets of various sizes and shapes, though almost always they add something else to give me bulk and color. One convenient technique is to drop me onto a sugar cube, where I remain until you this is where I have my effect, in the mind. That seven inches of inner space between the root of the nose and the back of the head. It is on all accounts man's most prized possession, and in many ways his most complicated. I'm like a depth charge here among the brain's 12 billion cells, but it's one of my most perplexing secrets that no one really knows yet how I work. Some have suggested that I affect the midbrain, the brain's computer, and prevent it from regulating signals from the eyes and the ears and the other sense organs. But while there's much uncertainty about how I work, there is no uncertainty about what I can do. With just a very few micrograms of me inside the body, colors, shapes, smells, textures, the whole range of things that can be seen, heard, smelled, touched, and tasted, take on incredible distortions which seem absolutely and totally real. With just a few micrograms of me, all sorts of hallucinations are possible. I couldn't see anything except colors, and I thought, well, you know, this is supposed to be reality, but it wasn't. It wasn't anything except just 
things that weren't objects. You know, after a while, you don't know who you are, and you don't know who the other person is. It's happening, and it's happening so fast, and you can't stop it, and and you just can't do anything. You just have to, you know, just stay there and and go through it. With my help, all kinds of things are possible. The most dangerous act can look attractive and easy to accomplish because I can make those sparkling lights look colorful and inviting. A moving tapestry which can beckon and lure a traveler to join them. Well, that's just a rough idea of what a few micrograms of me can do. About the same amount that you saw on the point of the pin. Remember? But in spite of my overwhelming power, I have yet to kill anyone from an overdose. They don't think I'm physiologically addicting. And when I'm swallowed, I disappear because they haven't yet perfected a good field test to detect me inside the body. Altogether, I'm one of the most perplexingly powerful drugs conceivable. Your doctor can't prescribe me. Your druggist can't sell me. And very few scientists are able or willing to test me and the pharmaceutical companies won't make me. And about the only labs I show up in anymore are the crime labs at police headquarters because I'm so perplexingly powerful that I'm illegal. Federal law controls my manufacture, sale, transportation, and delivery. And in California, where I'm listed in the Dangerous Drug Act, law prohibits my manufacture, transportation, sale, possession, or public use. So very often I wind up here, tagged as evidence along with other illegal drugs like heroin and opium and marijuana and bennies and goofers and yellow jackets and crystal and the rest. But they use the most sensitive tests they have to identify me. This one's called thin layer chromatography, useful because I can be made to fluoresce under ultraviolet light. And my unique chemical fingerprints can be identified on the graph of instruments like the spectrophotometer, which can detect as little as 10 micrograms of me, much less than a pinpoint can hold. But as narcotics officers know so well, I keep showing up, in spite of the laws. Because if you have the right ingredients, I'm not too hard to manufacture. And the black market boys have set up their amateur laboratories in some strategic locations. Like this one, served with a warrant and then raided just a while ago. Amateur acid, made in amateur labs by amateur chemists. When I'm compounded in dirty labs like this, it isn't surprising that I'm often contaminated with other substances. And that my quantity is unpredictable. 200 micrograms? Or 2,000. Pure LSD. Or mixed up with something else. On the consumer level, that means that when an LSD travel agent sells a cap or two, the customer can't trust the label. Because there isn't any label. So how do you know what you're getting? You don't know unless you take it, whether it's good or it's bad. You just have to trust your source. Well, when you take it, you find out. <laughs> Good acid, bad acid, but always unpredictable acid. I'm around, part of the scene, as I said. And on streets like this, and this, and this, and this, transactions involving me take place all the time. Illegal, of course. But my tabs and caps and sugar cubes that dissolve in your mind as well as your mouth are selling every day. <laughs> so drop a cap of me and join the mind-expanding world where colors and sounds and smells and tastes and people all take on new dimensions and new qualities. I'm the world's original instant relief drug. Drop a cap of me, man and drop out, but watch it, because the trip can be a trap, too. You never know where a ticket with me will take you. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, stop that, man. Where stop are that. you, man? Stop You're that not here, man. man. You know, Let me give you an idea, just the barest idea of what a bum trip can be like. Voices, courtesy of those who've been there. Wait a minute. terrifying, utterly powerful, and utterly unpredictable. I've even been known to carry a passenger inside the pulsing redness of his own beating heart and leave him there. So here, Mark. Oh, most people survive even a really bad trip. And with an injection of one of the most powerful tranquilizers known, they can get safely back to reality. Relax. But not all, not all. Because you see, it's true that trippers have injured themselves, sometimes seriously. And one of the most terrifying things of all is true too. A bum trip's hallucinations can recur at any time in all their original intensity, up to a year after the original dose. Some call it an after flash, and it's not fun at all. Once I've been swallowed, it's practically impossible to trace me inside the body, so not even the coroner knows how to tell whether or not I was part of this scene, twisting the driver's brain cells until he tripped out through the windshield. Hello, Steve Rescue. And it's true that the effects and after effects of bad trips can be so severe that special organizations like San Francisco's LSD Rescue have been set up. And crisis counselors work in shifts 24 hours a day to calm and guide those who panicked and freaked out. If I don't know what to do with myself, I, so I... How much do you take? How much LSD do you take? 300 micrograms. One whole cap? One of those pills, you know. It happens all the time. This guy knows. He called LSD Rescue 24 hours ago, and he's just about got himself under control now. Did that serve to frighten you even more? Yeah, because I felt like um, somehow I was being twisted out of shape, um, and that... Uh, I was somehow not a human being. Did you have the thought you might not be able to change backwards again? Yeah, Back this is one of the main things that scared me, is permanently make me a, some sort of freak. And it happens with increasing frequency that those who trip with me find their way here to neuropsychiatric centers, like this one at San Francisco's Macaulay Institute of St. Mary's Hospital. It's freezing. <laughs> Susie, you'll be staying with us for a little while here. He'll be your doctor while you're at the hospital. No! Until you're feeling No! Good. No! All right, all right. No! Now, now, okay, Susie, now, Susie, now, Susie. Come on. Take it easy. We'll be all right. Thank you, doctor. And it takes a while. Sometimes a considerable while. And the skillful attention of psychiatrists to gain the confidence and cooperation of patients who have tripped badly with me. It's not always easy to undo what I've done. You look a little frightened to us and we want to help you. One of the things that we'd like you to do before we talk is to take some medication to help you come on down. Put the pill in your mouth. Take the, no, put the pill in your mouth. 
But for an increasing number of trippers, this too is true. Because the ultimate destination with me can be, and has been, here in the morgue. LSD user hang a self. LSD user commit suicide. Yes, it's true. And so the last voice heard at the ultimate destination can be, and has been, the autopsy surgeons. The body is that of a well-developed, well-nourished teenage male appearing the stated age. Rigor mortis is present throughout, and live ore is present over the dorsal aspects of the body. And so I'm depressed. Depressed because I'm so badly misused and abused by those who know so little about me. Good trips with me. Profound, mind-expanding insights about oneself and one's universe. Yes, for some people, under some conditions, I have been, and I can be, a most awe-inspiring way for exploring inner space. But even they have to understand that I'm unpredictable in what I may do, and that I'm never the sort of thing that one takes lightly or for kicks. Because, you see, I can kick back. And I'm embarrassed because so many of the world's oddballs have adopted me as their special gimmick. I'm too powerful and I'm too important to join these con artists as part of Acid City. And I'm concerned. I'm really concerned because so many people who get busted for using me are or were such really promising kids. But there's no known way to get your fingerprints out of the police files once they're in there. And for the rest of their lives, a lot of people are going to have to answer yes to the question, have you ever been arrested? And that's not much help when it comes to getting a job or getting into college or launching a career. But most of all, I'm frightened because so much remains to be known about me. Why should my hallucinations recur later in an afterflash? And is there any way of preventing them? Will they develop a good workable test to trace me inside the body so that coroners and others can tell whether or not I was taken? And if so, how much? Do I damage the brain or don't I? And if so, how much damage do I cause, and how lasting is it? Here at the Macaulay Institute, they've been studying those who've tripped many times with me. And instruments like the electroencephalograph have indicated brainwave abnormalities. But even while those abnormal tracings tend to improve after my use stops, certain other abnormalities tend to persist, perhaps permanently. And recently, laboratory and clinical tests have indicated that my powerful chemistry can damage human chromosomes, the tiny determiners of heredity. And scientists have begun to link my use to the kind of cell change that can lead to the birth of physically or mentally abnormal children. The answers aren't all in yet, and research continues. Meanwhile, as one authority has suggested, my continual users might donate their brains after death to help scientists clarify matters. Portrait of a traveler about to take a trip, and his trip is just now starting. He's stuck with me now and what we may do together for the next few hours. I'm not vicious by nature, but I'm not harmless either. Remember, I said I was like a depth charge in the mind. Well, the direction and force of my explosion among his 12 billion brain cells is absolutely and totally unpredictable. When you tinker with your brain by altering its natural processes with an unknown dose of an unknown drug, you have to take your chances. But curiously enough, 
the kind of trip he'll take won't depend upon my chemistry as much as his. Because, you see, it's my real secret that I strip away the layers and layers of ego, the protective security blanket that shelters you all. And I can bring him into the incredible world of his own deep brain dreamscape. Of course, when he actually gets there, he may be terrified by what he sees. But that's his problem, not mine.